Well, welcome everyone. My name is Glenn Crooks, uh, 23 years, a division one head coach on the women's side. Currently I'm a play-by-play -play commentator for New York City FC of MLS. I also host a weekly show, Sirius XM FC, the Coaching Academy, coaching education and uh, player development. And uh, a, a very uh, important conversation coming up today as uh, the focus of this summit is uh, that women's soccer is serious business and club soccer is serious business with incredible investment and uh, economic opportunity. And we have uh, two of the best who are going to help talk us through this conversation. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some fun along the way as well. Uh, first, Elise LeHue, who is the general manager for Sky Blue FC of the uh, NWSL, previously with uh, the Chicago Red Stars in the same position of NWSL. She's a co-founder of Gonzo Soccer, the International Girl Soccer and Leadership Academy that targets underserved youth girls. Also an adjunct professor at East Tennessee State University, where she instructs a course on fundraising in sports. And because of Elise, I get a weekly newsletter, which she put the time in to make sure that everybody gets this thing. Uh, it's Women's Sports Business Newsletter, uh, womenxsport.com. You should get Ari if you don't have it. You got to get this. And uh, yeah, Elise, send <laughs> and, uh, and, and the, the title of it, with only 4% of media coverage dedicated to women's sports, even less covers the business side of women's sport. And Elise, I got to tell you, I've, uh, I've, really, uh, I've really enjoyed, I haven't read every article, but there's some fascinating stuff in there. So Elise, welcome. Thank you. Ari, top that background. That was a, oh, you, wait a, minute. a competition. We worked together. Here we right? go. <laughs> I got a good <laughs> one for Ari. You heard about my resume for that one. Well done. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank I you. you pay though. <laughs> Hey, right, I so do what I have to do. So here's Ari. All right, we got it. Uh, <laughs> Ari Hinks. She is an assistant oh. manager for one of the top clubs uh, in the world, Wolfsburg, in the Frauen mm -hmm. Bundesliga, a founding member of the Women's Bundesliga in 1973. She has 173 caps for the German national team between 1996 and 2011, twice a World Cup winner in 03 and 07 when she was on the World Cup All-Star team. She's getting close to beating you now, Elise. Uh, a four, you know, <laughs> four time. Stop there. That's I want to be on my team anyway. <laughs> four time <laughs> European champion with Germany. Uh, and uh, here in the States, we know her best. I think, you know, we many people know her as a player, but I think we know her best for her commentary on Fox Soccer. She was a studio host for the, uh, the last two World Cups, famously losing a bet with Alexi Lalas in 2015. Oh. When the so U.S. beat Germany in the semifinals, and uh, Ari Hingst had to put on a U.S. jersey and sing the national anthem. She did not welch on the bet, man. She followed through. Fantastic. Yeah, apologies for my singing, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ari, welcome. Uh, uh, an honor to be with you both. Uh, at least I want to go to you first. I think get some general comments here, and then we'll 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 play off of all this. But uh, just to, and I don't want to assume anybody knows the history of Sky Blue or the history of Ari or the history of Elise. But Sky Blue started in 2009 before the NWSL was born. And uh, in that very first season, winning the WPS championship. But unfortunately, eight of the last nine, uh, nine seasons, Sky Blue hasn't even made it to the postseason. Seven of those uh, with the NWSL. That's except for 2020, of course. I'll get to that. Uh, because in the NWSL Challenge Cup, uh, you reached the semifinals this year out in Utah in this uh, very uh, awkward and bizarre and unfortunate circumstances of the COVID and how we had to adjust the schedule. Uh, but at least it was very much uh, off the field that where there was a lot of uh, damage to the reputation of the franchise before your arrival. Uh, not a favored destination of players. I think the clearest example of that 2019 draft Haley Mace and Julia Ashley elected not to, to come in and play. The supporters group, Cloud9, they were very frustrated. But you have won them back. You have won the community back. And, uh, you know, that's about the point you came in. And just as, as an introduction, I mean, it, it really has been a transformation, Elise. And I wonder, I know the job and the task is enormous for you, but can you give us just a, a, a little bit of a clear picture of what you were up against and how you really got it moving in the right direction? Yeah, you were you were taking me to a dark place there, Glenn. You brought up some. No, but we're but uh, we're back to brightness. We're back to brightness. 
good. Um, yeah, look, I, I think it's been well publicized, some of the challenges at Sky Blue um, historically. And, um, you know, I was able to come in last April and in a year and a half have had, uh, um, you know, just been able to work hand in hand with um, Tammy Murphy, one of the owners who really stepped up. And she and I both um, just blocked and tackled, as we as we said, we both had a vision for this club to take it to a place that it maybe hadn't been before. Um, I have strong beliefs in this club. If you're you're going to be a club in uh, you know the New Jersey, New York City area, you need to be you need to be boastful. You need to be proud. You need to really put plant your flag here. This is a, a really great area for women's soccer and for youth soccer, and we've seen the talent that's come out of this area. Um, and a professional club here needs to represent that. So. I think at the end of the day, I have huge aspirations. I can, you know, look to Ari's club there for some inspiration and, um, you know, goal setting that we want to do here. But, uh, you know, we'll take it one step at a time. And I think the first thing for us was was earning back the trust of our fans. You brought up Cloud9, our supporters group. And that's really been, um, uh, you know, part of the procedure is earning back their trust. And, and with that, then we've created an environment to um, create a welcoming space for partners and sponsors because that's a really important revenue stream for us. You know, we've got ticket sales, that's really important. And then the other major revenue stream is always corporate partners. And um, I'm really pleased to say that our partners over the last year all stayed supporting us during COVID, which was incredible. Um, we were able to retain all of that investment and transition them into maybe not game day items, but doing more digital content. All our partners stayed with us. And I think that to me is a tremendous sign of our growth, even just in a year that we were able to keep all our partners on, keep them happy. 95% um, of our season ticket members, even though we didn't have a season, actually uh, stayed with us. Either they let us keep their money this year as a digital membership or they're converting it to a 2021 season ticket. 95%, that's a really incredible number. So for us to be able to retain all of our partners and add a few partners during COVID, plus retain 95% of our season ticket membership sales, um, I feel pretty good right now, even though it's coming off of a pandemic year. So getting back to the business side of things, I think at Sky Blue, we've created an environment where um, people want to be a part of this, both uh, fans, sponsors, and I want to continue to uh, grow both of those areas moving forward. Can you give an example, Elise? Uh, you talked about creating an environment. You mentioned that two or three times there, and that's uh, obviously a focal point of uh, what you wanted to accomplish on your way in. But can you give an example of, of, of something you did, an example or two of, of how you created the uh, that proper environment? Sure. I think uh, right now is a great time. We just finished our season Saturday, so I'm doing exit interviews with all the players right now. And um, last year, my exit interviews, you could you could imagine how those might have gone um, after, you know, some tumultuous years. The wish list was very long for players, you know, and it was things like we want a better training facility. We need a proper grass pitch. We need a proper stadium, like really high level things that they were, you know, they deserve to have as professional players. And again, off season went into that blocking and tackling to try to knock out every one of those things. And I'm about halfway through exit interviews as of right now. Um, I have a few more this afternoon. Um, when I get to, hey, what's your wish list? What, what do we need to improve as a club? I think we've made such a growth that they don't have much to say. I'm, I'm actually shocked that I, I have almost nothing. I think a few players said, oh, I'd like to have a few more pairs of boots. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, major last problem. Year, yeah, last year it was like, we need a new facility and we need like, really. now it's like a pair of boots? Okay, you're good. I'll, we'll go get you that tomorrow. Like no problem. That like, My job just got a lot easier. So um, I think to give you a specific example is just talking about that extreme difference between what my interviews looked like last year and what they look like this year, um, just amongst the players in terms of that growth, um, speaking to the player side of things. And um, I think that's the best example I can give you right now. Elisa, I think it's great that you that you said last year there were so high demands, but then when you talk about high demands, we're talking about basics. You're talking about good training facilities. You're talking about opportunities for practice, uh, an athletic room or something like that. This is basics. When we talk about a club like yours is, there shouldn't even be a discussion, discussion about it to have it. So that's sad that you even have to implement it within a year. And this, talking about 2020, 2019, this is what a club should already have playing on this level of soccer. Yeah, 100%. And I, I now want them to dream bigger. That shouldn't have been the big dream is to have a you know, proper facility and playing in a pro venue. That shouldn't be the big dream. And now they don't, it's almost like, 
they're forgetting how to dream now. They're forgetting because yeah. they knocked out all these big things. Now they're like, okay, we're good now. It's okay. Yeah. And I'm like, no, what do you want? What do you want? We need to do demands. We need yeah, to develop. Like, if you don't have demands, you're not going to progress. For sure. So maybe I could, uh, maybe I should have an interview with you. I feel like you'll have a few. Oh, <laughs> such a long list. Ask me. <laughs> I want to hear it. Let's, let's go to Ari well, next. I, want to I hear think this. it's happening right here. Love this. So, and you concluded the season at least with a three-one win over Chicago, and that's just a a, yeah. a good feel, man. You go into the off season feeling good about yourself. Yeah, we had a yeah, it, fall season was up and down, so I think to end on a high note, um, certainly against my former club, it's always nice to to have a good victory. So it was, uh, you know, three goals in the first half. Can't argue that. It was a great way to end the year, and I think, uh, you know, it's just nice to go into the off season on a high for sure. So Ari, your uh, club is uh, kind of just getting underway with your season. You're, you're a few matches in and um, uh, not quite at the top of the table. Bayern is there. And I know you've got a big match against them pretty soon. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the level of consistency in your program and success, I mean, you're a regular in the, the, the Champions League final uh, along with Lyon. I don't know how many times you guys have met in the last few years, but uh, so many I think times. it's five or six. And uh, that's a bit of a bugaboo right now, right? Yeah, that's not the best topic, is it? Like, all of the time losing against uh, Lyon. But uh, I'll tell you what, like, I came to Wolfsburg, it's almost six years now, and I haven't been in, in Germany in women's, women's soccer for a few years. I, I was overseas in Australia, I got back to Germany, getting back into soccer, and I came to Wolfsburg, and I was surprised about the level of professional work that has been done here. And, of course, you got the big clubs, so you got the training facilities, stuff like this, that also needed to improve, but... The, the level of professional work when it comes to the coaching staff, to the physiotherapists and uh, the, the players, the players' attitudes and stuff like that, I've never seen or worked in an environment that is so professional. Um, maybe the women national team in Germany, but never on a club level. So um, I think Wolfsburg has done a good job and that's the reason why I've been successful for so many years. But we have to continue building on that because other clubs, they don't sleep. They're getting closer and closer, and um, we have to to keep our bar rising to to get better as well, um, that we don't get overrun by other clubs. Yeah, when I went on your website and then just was looking for the staff and all, all the different support people, and uh, the list is extensive. I mean, the number of physios you have, for instance, you know, eclipses most clubs I've seen on the women's level. Uh, th that's a high number, but now when you're talking, I mean, of course, 2020 is a special uh, year for everyone, but with Corona, right now, we don't even have enough physiotherapists. We, our squad isn't even big enough. We have so many matches, like the players didn't get any rest in summertime. They get two weeks off, which is almost nothing. We played Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday, and as you can tell in the Bundesliga, um, the, the injuries are rising, and us as well. Now we have four to five players who are really badly injured, and I don't think that's the end of it already. So right now, we would even need more physios, but in, in saying so, right now we're on a good level. It's good to have like three physios, and this is what we have to keep on demanding. I know other clubs don't have it, but we want more. We want better. If we want to get better, we need the best facilities we can have, and that comes to manpower and anything you can work with. And you're talking about budget there too. And you talked about being part of a, a big club. And I wonder, Elise, you know, can can women's franchises survive on their own in this particular time? Uh, is it vital to be attached to uh, a, a program or a club uh, that's, you know, already, uh, you know, dug into the uh, into the landscape uh, in your area it would be maybe the New York Red Bulls or New York City FC and you think of the Red Bulls first because you were supposed to play in Red Bull Arena so is that an important part of the equation for clubs across the world do you think Look, I think there's uh, certain economies of scale when you can be part of something more than just a women's professional soccer team, whether that's another men's pro team or a men's semi-pro team, or maybe it's a peripheral sport, as we've seen in some other sports in the U.S. Um, I think having those economies of scale to be able to share staff is helpful. Um, I've also been a really big proponent of making sure that you are dedicating enough staff specifically on the women's side. Um, so that it's not just a side thought to a men's professional team. Now, I think the biggest, again, economies are the training facility, the um, you know professional venue. We don't have a lot of mid-sized venues in the U.S. 
um, you know, where we have the option to, we either play at the men's fully professional venue, or we're going to be at something like a college venue. There's nothing really in between in the U.S. right now, those like, you know, eight to 12,000 seat venues, there's not many of them specific to soccer. Um, so I think in that regard, it's um, really helpful to, to share those economies. Um, but at the same time, I'm a huge proponent of making sure that you have staff that is fully 100% dedicated to the women's team because that is what they deserve and that is what it's going to take to uh, make these players feel fully professional and to continue to grow the game worldwide, realistically. But we hear about the the professional side of it. And Ari, I think this is a good time to perhaps you have a video uh, from your club uh, prepared to show. So let's let's run that and then we'll talk on the other side. In times like these, you have to stay strong. It's been 75 years and we're still hungry. With 11 women in leadership roles. Ich krieg richtig Gänsehaut. Honestly, we're absolutely fed up with prejudices. <laughs> and don't go saying we never have any fans. Ha ha ha. To put it simply, we miss you. Good kick. All right. Well, we really? probably we probably could get a little uh, translation. A What's that? Ari brought a video. That's so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, someone should have told you. <laughs> you have more staff than I do. <laughs> so uh, Ari, obviously, it's a promotion video of the club. Oh, it was great. Right, it's for the club. It's for the for the men mm -hmm. and the women. And and right before we ran it, Ari, you know, Elise referred to yeah, sharing w with with the men's side. Yes, but we don't want to be considered an afterthought. And it certainly mm -hmm. doesn't look like you are there. No, no. I tell you, there's always pros and cons working with a big company or with a big club. And uh, obviously, um, with this video, for example, it's just one example of many where. The women team is involved in, in club business and stuff like this as well. Um, when we do some promotional stuff or we do some pictures and anything, the club tries to implement the women team as well. Um, in saying so, but it's always a problem who who sits on the biggest chair, who's interested. If, if, if it's always personal. If a person wants to, to have women's soccer, they're going to promote it even more. But if someone is not interested, interested in it then we're just here and we make our own business that's fine they don't interrupt us or anything but they don't necessarily support us but right now we have a lot of people in the club who say we want to support women's sector as well um i still think there's a lot of thing we can improve we can be seeing much more there are more possibilities to combine both the men's team and the women's team and we have to keep on demanding, but I think with this club, we're on a good way to to have a, a big franchise for, for both. And, and Elise mentioned uh, the partners that are helping Sky Blue grow. And, you know, you've got national partners, you've got international partners, you've got women partners. You know, it's, it's, it's an impressive list. Now, is that all uh, in coordination with the men's side or do you have like separate entities there in terms of partnerships? No, you have the, the big partnerships, like obviously VWC is, is the biggest and the biggest well, franchise. Yeah. And, and uh, so most of the sponsors, they, they come in for the club, the whole team. And then I think there's just one or two small ones that are only based for the, for the women's section, but then it's all just one. So on one, on one hand, we're never going to get into financial trouble or problems, especially with Corona. A lot of clubs were struggling, but we were happy enough to have a big company behind us all salaries were saved, uh, no people needed to get fired, stuff like this. But it's harder sometimes when you get the small sponsors to get them in because they, they won't fit in such a big club. So it's the pros and cons. We're on the safe side, but it's it's hard to sometimes step out and maybe have some sponsors that are better for women instead of the men's team. And what was uh, significant about the video too was uh, the mention of 11 uh, women in leadership positions uh, in the club. 
And I've talked to a, a, a few women uh, influencers recently. Uh, Jill Ellis last week, uh, she started a scholarship fund. Courtney Levinson and Tracy Hamm are doing something called womeninsoccer.org, which is going to uh, launch very soon in support of the women's game. Uh, but they all, all three of them use the word allies, and they were referring to men. So Elise, how important, you know, this is a, a male-dominated sport still, how important it is is it to get the male allies on board for you to uh, to further push this thing along? Yeah, I, um, I think most people know me to be fairly blunt when I talk, so I'll just be really specific. Women don't control a lot of the wealth, um, especially in the United States. So, you know, there's a strong chorus um, requesting more women in ownership roles within our league or in women's professional sports leagues, but. I go back to looking at more uh, societal wise that women don't control a lot of the wealth. So we're, we're trying to find women that have enough wealth to be able to invest in these clubs. Um, but the reality is I just don't think we're fully there yet. I mean, we've seen a really unique example with Angel City and they have a lot of celebrity investors on their board. Um, but traditionally, you know, these barriers to entry for women are just really quite high. So if we're talking about allies. I don't think our league can survive without men that are investing in our game. So we absolutely need that. And we've had owners that have invested for years. I mean, even Sky Blues owners have been doing this for over a decade now. Um, Arnhem in Chicago has been doing it for a long time. Bill Lynch in Washington. We've got these owners that have been doing this for a decade. And again, you, you don't make money off this yet. We're not there. So you're talking about yearly losses every single year and they're willing to continue investing. So I think immediately in terms of allies, I think I go right to the top level and like we wouldn't be here without men that are investing in the game. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to that and grateful to the opportunities that they've given me to be able to do this. Um, at the same time, I hope that at least in the NWSL, we can continue to evolve in a way that um, that men recognize the need for more women and more diversity amongst our staff, coaching staff, front office staff, even at the board of directors level. Um, there's not a lot of women and that I've always found very alarming as a women's professional league that we don't have a lot of women being, being able to be at the table to bring their ideas and their background and concepts to the table. I think that's where we're going to innovate and continue to innovate as the league. We've seen Lisa Baird come in as commissioner recently. That, of course, was driven by the Board of Governors, which is primarily owners. Um, she's been incredible. We've seen the the business impact that she's had on our league and the way um, we were the first pro sports league in the U.S. to have a successful bubble tournament. Um, that was really driven by Lisa at the top. And she also not only pulled that off, but brought in a lot of major sponsors um, to the league as well. Secret, PNG, uh, Verizon, Google, um, these major sponsors that in the middle of a pandemic were willing to come into this. Um, and be a part of us. Um, and I know you'll have Lindsay Behrens, who um, works on the media side for NWSL. I know she's on a panel tomorrow, so I'll let her speak more eloquently to all of that, but um, just wanted to at least be able to touch on that. So um, I could go on about allies, but um, you know, we wouldn't be here without men that were willing to invest in the game and continue to invest um, as we move forward. Well, but as you mentioned, I think a key thing is like, of course, American works totally different from Germany. You get the ownerships for the clubs and with us, it's a little bit different, but it's it's not really the ownership or what, where the money comes from, but we need more women and the staff team and the team around the team and the business part, stuff like this. I'm not talking about 100% women because this is not going to work well. And this is nothing that anyone wants because I think it's important to have diversity in all ranges. But for so many years, even the women's game have only been driven by the men. There have hardly been any female coaches, any staff members. And so now the demand for women is so, so much higher until we reach a really good level. And this is the bigger part of it. Get more women involved. Get uh, ex-players involved in the game. Get them staying with it because they know where it comes from. You need some outside views as well, but get a good diversity. And this is more the key, I think, than do you have a male or a female owner. What What is the... Uh media responsibility here. And I mentioned that because while you were talking, Elise, and describing that the NWSL was the first bubble, highly successful, uh, were you annoyed at all by the fact that that was ignored by the major media? Oftentimes they were referring to hockey or the NBA and, and MLB. I remember seeing Major League Baseball, Alex Rodriguez, one of the big voices in the game, one of the great players in the game, who just was unaware that mm -hmm. women's soccer was doing the same thing and did it first. 
Yeah, I mean, take it a step further. You had uh, the lacrosse league came in after the men's lacrosse league, and even their the the head of that league came went on live video and said that they were the first to successful, and that we literally were at the same venue just before them. So um, annoyance just comes with the territory, Glenn. I think you have to get used to it. Um, it's just, you, you, I, I mean, we saw it. I was seeing a lot of commentary on Twitter yesterday about you know major publication did the same thing. So um, it just keeps going. All we can do is you know kind of keep battling it along the way at the end of the day um you know we we're, we're a 10 team league right now with the expansion on the horizon which is obviously very exciting but that's you know it's small at the end of the day um and for us we need more major media to cover us i think that's going to be the next frontier in terms of us being able to continue to drive more partnerships and more eyeballs and more interest in our game um so yeah we absolutely need the media but i'm not naive to the changing landscape of media and the way that you know, realistically, you know, newspapers have started to die off a bit. And a lot of the media online is, uh, it's, a, it's a pay to view media now, even a lot of the major sports publications, you have to have a subscription to it. Um, and obviously, the clicks are the most important thing for them for their survival and for the folks that are writing the article survival. So I'm not naive to the challenges that are in the media industry. But um, it also would be very nice to have more than 4% coverage in the U.S. I think that would, even if we doubled that number, what a tremendous difference it would make um, for us in terms of our attendance or um, just general viewer viewership numbers moving forward. Elise LeHue, GM for Sky Blue FC. You can see that. It's all written out. Uh, Ari didn't write anything out, so we're not sure who she is. No. Yeah, I'm too naive. I thought it was just for you guys. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have written a whole letter about me. No. Ari, have you ever done this before? Like, you know, been on a live event? I'm a newie. I'm a newie. Yeah, I'm brand new here. So, uh, and you want to follow Ari? It's at Ari Hingst. And follow Elise at A. LeHue. Ari's kind enough to write things in German and English so that we uh, we all can uh, can understand what she's uh, uh, referring to. So, I, you know, there were a, a couple of things here that I want to follow up with. I mentioned Jill Ellis earlier, and uh, I don't know if you're both aware, but she is, um, uh, The Athletic reported it first, and now ESPN has confirmed that she is a, a legitimate candidate for the uh, head coaching position for DC United, a men's team, in a major league soccer. Ari, your uh, reaction? Um, oh, and this is a really sad part. The first thing that comes to mind, oh, hopefully it's not just a promotion thing or it's a joke to get people talking. Hopefully yeah. it's a real one. And it's sad that this is my first thought in instead of, wow, she might be coaching, the, she might be the first female coach. Um, the, here's the thing. I don't think that, that gender plays a big role. It, it shouldn't really matter. And there are more and more sports. Like I think in the NFL, you had two women coaches. You had the, the female referee. I think it's building up. Um, I know that in the soccer world, it's hard. Maybe in America, it might be a little bit easier. You don't have such a long history like you have in Europe or in Germany, for example. But I think it's great. And you put a role model out there. And uh, if she gets the job or not, I just hope it's serious business. And we shouldn't talk about if it's a female coach or male coach. It should just be who's the best person for this job and then just name her or him. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the way it should be. But it just uh, I had this discussion last night with someone and they were uh, kind of annoyed that it was like we're, we're we're looking at it as the first woman to do something. And I brought up the fact that I, I don't know if if this is. Uh, the right timing for Jill Ellis to get in a position like this. So at least my fear would be if it if it doesn't go well, and this is a franchise that's really struggling right now. If it doesn't go well, does that set things back for for women trying to gain positions like this? That's a good question that I can answer for all of society, but that's certainly part of the risk of anything. Um, you know, I, I think outside. I think it's fantastic you know, they should look at her. That's, that's great. Um, I would say that MLS has looked a little bit um, behind other men's pro leagues in the U S in terms of their embracing women as, you know, in, in technical roles, we've seen it already just mentioned in the NFL, you now have women um, that are on the coaching staff of NFL teams. We've seen it in the NBA quite frequently. Um, where a lot of NBA teams have uh, brought on former WNBA players to be part of their technical staff or their scouting staff and, you know, put them into roles where they can grow into. I think we're on the verge of, you know, Becky Hammond has to be up for consideration for a head coaching role in the NBA any any day now, if she hasn't already. 
Um, so I think MLS is, is a little bit behind other leagues in that regard, but I also can't say much about them when the NWSL is so far behind as well in hiring women into coaching roles. So I would be, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to throw, uh, throw stones at a glass house when I see our own league so far behind. So I think an NWSL has to set the table for getting more women into coaching roles. Over the last year, I've been really pleased at seeing more former players come into roles um, here, obviously at Sky Blue. We brought Becca Moros on after she had retired, uh, Lou Sitch in Chicago. Obviously, Amy LaPelbet has come in as the associate um, or interim head coach in Utah. Steph Cox has been at the Reign. Um, Nadine, of course, in Portland. So I, I like this consistency of bringing in more um, former players, more women into assistant coaching roles. Now we got to get to the next step. Like I know there are some of them that are ready to be a head coach. So let's start to consider them more for those head coaching roles. And I hope that's the next step of our NWSL evolution. Hopefully from there, we're going to see more opportunities for women in MLS as well, whether it's head coach or even assistant coach or any positions across the technical staff. I should I add that. Jump into, you ask about yeah. the right timing. I mean, what is the right time? You're going to try and you're going to fail. Then you're going to stand up and you fight again and you're going to make it better. So, I mean, you always there's always a starting point. Someone has to be the first mm -hmm. and it'd rather be today than tomorrow. And, of course, she might fail, but she might succeed as well. Mm -hmm. But I also do agree, like in, in German Bundesliga, it doesn't look better. I think I might be wrong. I think you only got one female coach right now. But another problem is um, we get the numbers higher and higher. But we didn't have female coaches for so, for such a long time. Uh, players that retired, they must have a different job to make an earning because they didn't have any money from playing soccer, so they needed a different job. There was any opportunity to stay within the game or start a family, so they couldn't stay there. Now we get more and more female coaches, so we get the numbers higher and the quality is there. Not in the big number yet, but they are players and who should be good coaches. And like you said, we, we got to implement them and it should be more and more. But saying so, you shouldn't get the job just because you're female. You should get the job because you're good in it and you're going to prove that you're going to be good. Of course, you're going to fail from time to time. I mean, how many coaches lose their job after one, two, three months? But no one cares. But if you're female and you lose the job, then it should be a big problem. I don't think that's right. And I should mention the reason I was talking to Jill last week, she just started a scholarship fund, which is to support female candidates for high level advanced uh, U.S. soccer badges like the pro license or the A or the B. What's the situation in Germany regarding how uh, women are supported in that area? And you're an assistant coach uh, with one of the top teams in the world. Is this an aspiration of yours, Ari? And, and how do you how do you take the next step? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> what my next uh, step is? I think in in Germany it's it's rather supportive. Um, when when I ended my career, um, a lot of uh, national players got um, offered to make the training license. I wasn't able to because I was overseas, but they got the chances. And just yesterday, I, I talked to Britta Karlsson, who is assistant coach with the national team, and she's also there with the development of of women's soccer. And she told me that they want to have a next license for. Um, players who retired, stuff like that. And more and more players that I even used to play with are coaching the under 15, under 17, under 19s now. So they do implement them and you get more opportunities. But in Germany, um, I'm pretty sure right now, if you're a female in the uh, soccer business, you won't have the chance in the men's world. Right now, it's rather stuck to the women's side and get some jobs there. But it's it's getting better and better. I wonder you two, you know, I, I started the this uh, panel off by saying, you know, soccer is a serious business on the women's side, incredible investment and economic opportunity. Um, if that's true, Elise, why? You know, and what are the things that you're trying to implement that can make it more obvious? Uh, we've talked enough or, or we've talked about sponsorship and how important that is. Um, can you give us some uh, some ideas there? Yeah, I always start with, you know, when we are covered um, a little more fully, you you see the results of that. So I always go to these um, World Cup moments, which we have over every four years. The World Cup always tends to be this pop culture moment in the U.S. And I had a really eye opening moment. I remember going in a Starbucks by our office um, after the U.S. You know, I think they won the semifinal. So They're going to the final and every newspaper on the newsstand. We were on the front page and I was like, 
this is an alternate universe. This never happens. You don't usually see that. You could scroll through to the back page and usually you don't see anything about women's soccer in there. So it was like an alternate universe, but then all these celebrities hop on board and it's like everywhere you turn, everyone's talking about it, like tuning into the game, they're watching, they're excited, they're supporting. I think that when there's a little more attention on it and people know that the games are happening and they know the players, um, which is something the media does during the World Cup and they don't often do other times, um, people latch on to it and they're excited to follow it and excited to see how the team's going and excited to you know publicly support it. Um, so I, I always think about these World Cup moments. If we could have just a little bit more of that through our regular years and a little bit more of that for our professional leagues, um, in terms of the coverage that I know the followership is there. And I think the second thing, and um, maybe this is even more important is look at what we've done with so little coverage. And if you look at the life cycle of women's pro soccer, even I'll just talk to the U S obviously compared to where, you know, other men's professional leagues were at in their eighth, ninth, 10th year. Um, we're dramatically ahead of where they were at at that time. And I think we do so much with so little, and we've been able to stretch it really far um, and our, our partners, our sponsors that have come on board have even helped to promote us and helped to expand that reach. I, I speak to a partner like Budweiser, who you kind of saw everywhere. They really took on their own marketing initiatives around women's soccer. And that, that type of two-way partnership has been absolutely fantastic for our league and for the growth of our sport in the U.S. So I, I think we've done a lot with what we have. And even the numbers around the Challenge Cup at a time when there weren't a lot of other pro sports leagues playing and we were getting a little bit more attention then, the numbers were fantastic. The viewership numbers spiked. They were the highest we've ever had. Um, all of our, our numbers this year were the highest we've ever had as a women's professional league. And I think that speaks volumes because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So that's pretty exciting that even though we're in the middle of this really difficult time, we are growing exponentially and more people are tuning in and are following and are watching us. So we've got really great stats taking into next year that I'm excited to share with potential partners. Um, and I think we're still on an upward trajectory. So the, the more we can pitch in, the more partners we bring on board, the more exposure we can get. I think this is just going to continue growing for us moving forward. And I think social media, you, you talk about media and their responsibility to covering the sport, but social media, which you're, you're kind of in charge of uh, with your own your own Twitter account, your club's Twitter account, Instagram. I don't get. I don't go on Instagram too much. So I'm not really sure how deeply you're you're there. But uh, uh, to both of you, really, I mean that that's a way to get the message out about a personality profile. You know, really. Uh, and I, I see some of the things you've done, Elise, with the having your players on quiz night or you know, some of those different kinds of things. But that seems to be the way to really drive it. Yeah, I mean, it's been a phenomenal way to connect with fans. I mean, we started a lot of these digital events during the pandemic. Um, I always say I think I did them because I was at home alone and I was lonely. So it was nice to have these nights where I could like get together with people and not feel so alone. But, you know, we were doing it just to make our fans smile. It was a time to get together where we're not asking for money. We're not asking you to buy tickets. It was just like, hey, we're going through a really effing hard time right now and everybody's got their own thing they're going through. Let's try to just have a little sense of community. Um, but we've realized that these have been really, really great during the pandemic and we've taken a lot from that that we're actually gonna continue doing in the future. These are tools that I just hadn't really thought of before. We always think about doing in-person events, which are, you know, you gotta rent the space and get the catering and do it. Now we can just set up a, an online event that's actually quite easy. Um, we just did one last night with one of our players, Amani Dorsey, and the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. So we've also been able to use it for fun things like, you know, trivia night and just bingo, goofy things like that. But we also have been able to use it as a platform for the players to be able to express the things that are important to them. So we had this really great conversation last night about social justice in New Jersey, and it was really eye-opening. We invited our fans into this conversation, and that was a player-driven event. So I think digitally, we're going to continue to use this platform. It's It's been really eye-opening for me, the ways we can utilize it to uh, better relate to our community. Ari, how is, uh, how is uh, your club able to uh, use social media and uh, I, I'd be curious, uh, the social justice and change, how that's impacted your team and your club. 
Um, of course, it's a, it's a big topic. And nowadays, the first thing what the players do before the match, after the match, they go live on Instagram, they post their pictures, they talk about the match. And I think nowadays it's a good chance for the players to promote themselves and to get a marketing value. Um, I think in Germany, we're still behind when I look what's going on in England or maybe in the US. I think they are even more advanced with the potential and the followers and, and things like that. But I just wanted to add... Um, because I, I read an interview from you, Elisa, when you talked about uh, generating fans who come into the stadium, you have a big diversity, you have different age ranges. And I think we have a high potential of people that are that old that don't use Instagram and Twitter. Um, my mom, she has no idea what Twitter and Instagram, Instagram is. I mean, she wouldn't use it, but those people should also come into the stadium or should follow the players. So I think it's important to have different platforms. It's It's a high potential we have there but we need to, to generate all kinds of sources. You go into the newspapers, you go into the TV stations, you go online because you want to want to get the whole range of people to watch women's soccer and use that. And I think that's important. Ari, are you on Instagram? No, I, I'm just passively following. <laughs> Okay. Wow, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm a Twitter girl, and that's fair enough for me. That, that's all I can do. <laughs> no, like cat photos or anything. Nothing. For yeah, Instagram. and my food. I like and food. Photos okay. with my food and cats and. Okay. Wow. <laughs> well, you got to make it a little fun. I mean, <laughs> but Ari, Ari, what is it like? Uh, you know, we we attendance is certainly a, a major topic of discussion in the states. Um, what? How many will come out to a match uh, in normal circumstances? How many will come out to a, a home match uh, for Wolfsburg and for whether it's a big match or maybe a lesser match? Um, uh, I think the average sits somewhere in between two to three thousand um, people. In our stadium, I think it fits five thousand five hundred. And if we got the big matches, for example, playing Lyon again in the Champions League semifinals or quarterfinals. We get sold out with five and a half thousand. Or if we play Munich, we got around three thousand five hundred, four thousand spectators. And uh, for the normal game, even with, against the lower teams, we at least generate one thousand five hundred spectators. Right now, due to Corona, I mean, in Germany, we've been lucky enough to get the um, uh, spectators back into the stadium. Right now, we are around between six hundred and seven hundred. That's the maximum capacity of of. Um, uh, visitors we can have and it's such a big difference i mean when i started playing soccer i played in front of 100 and that yes. was that was even phenomenal and now you're used to 2000 3000 but when we had the first game back and it was only 500 the kids were like oh my god it's so different and even if they make small noises it, it's just a different feeling um yeah so so we're happy to have them back well we've just got a couple of minutes and i thought i'd uh, allow both of you to just give a a final thought, you know, about, uh, you know, we've, we've obviously been discussing the women's game. You both are involved in clubs that are, have, uh, you know, uh, different stories, but are trying to reach the same conclusion. Uh, are you first? How would you like to conclude? Um, like I said before, with, with Wolfsburg, we're in a comfortable position that we got support from the club, but we should never get tired of demanding more. Like Elisa said, like your players, they don't have any lists right now. That's wrong. Never be happy what, with what you've got. I mean, of course, you, you can be happy. It's like, okay, we have achieved something, but you have to aim for more. You have to keep on asking. You have to keep annoying people, get involved in the business. And this is important to never rest. Otherwise, we make a step backwards. At least, how about you? Yeah, you know, I'll always bring it back to business, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, you know, I've seen exponential growth in women's soccer here in the U.S. and women, really women's sports across the board. They've kind of led the way in a lot of social justice issues, have been very vocal. Um, we've seen exponential growth across, you know, our viewership numbers during the Challenge Cup and during this fall series. Um, you know, our sponsorship portfolio has increased pretty dramatically at the league and the club level. Um, I, I've told people I feel more optimistic now than I ever have in my 12, 13 years working in the women's pro game. Um, and, and people always go, really, really right now? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm seeing the numbers. I'm always a proof in the pudding type of person. I want to see the numbers behind it. But I'm more optimistic now than I've ever been. So, um, you know, my my plea to companies, corporations, individuals, is that now is the time to join right now while we're growing and to be a part of this growth because um, this has been a really exciting time for women's soccer. I think not just in the U.S., but worldwide. 
Um, and then finally, I've got to set up an interview with Ari because I need I need my next wish list uh, from the Wolfsburg status here. Um, so I'll be I'll, I'll be setting that up after this call. If you guys want to get your calendars out and set it up here, that's fine. Uh, I always make time for Elise, no doubt. <laughs> well, uh, special thanks to uh, both of you, uh, Ari Hinkst, who is uh, assistant manager for Wolfsburg. Good luck the rest of the season. She's a two-time World Cup champion. And I would imagine we'll see you uh, in the studio commentating again for Fox. Yes. Will we see that down the road? They're going to have me back. I promise not to sing any anthems again. But Well, I, I want to tell you this. A very short story is that I, uh, I told someone last night who's a, who's a supporter. He's a man who, uh, who, who uh, knew who you were and said she should be doing the men's games and the women's games. So uh, you have support out there. Well, thank the, uh, you. Uh, How much did you pay him, though? <laughs> <laughs> One of my colleagues. And then uh, Elise LeHue, the general manager for Sky Blue FC, National uh, Women's Soccer League. I, I wish you both the best, Ari, with the rest of your season uh, and, a, and a Champions League title this year or next year or however that's going to work out. Yeah. And, uh, and Elise, uh, you know, uh, sending off this past season on a great note with a victory over Chicago, your yeah. former club and uh, looking forward to the off-season. So thanks to you both. Thanks, thanks for having me, having the opportunity right. to talk. You're quite welcome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll be on again for Carolina Maracci and uh, James Clarkson, Houston for NWSL on Thursday at some point. It's been a pleasure, uh, and everybody have a great day.